Hello, Internet, and welcome back to Makers on Tap. Tonight, I'm your host, Joe, and with me tonight is... Aaron. And who are you two? I'm Ryan. I'm Nate. Got yeah, Nate and Ryan. Nate and Ryan. You guys have never heard those names before. New guest. We have. I, uh, the new guest. New guest. Oh, new guest. So, to start the night off, Aaron, what are you drinking? I am drinking the very last of the Blom Bros distillery whiskey. Oh, you even have like a nice snifter glass for yeah she got me the very nice sniff the sniffer glass and this has been an amazing whiskey i was planning on opening it up last weekend for the show but then we didn't record and i this is the last of it <laughs> drink the whole thing over the week oh God. it's amazing <laughs> we got to get aaron in check ryan what are you drinking <laughs> Um, I'm drinking a beer that I assume Nate didn't find in his vacation rental last weekend, unlike the previous beer. <laughs> this is an Anderson Valley Boont Amber Ale. It's got a, it features a, a bear with antlers, which is a very creative look. <laughs> and then, and then we have a backup here, which is a, a bottle of Dark Lord uh, from, from Three Floyds. Very nice. Never hear about three. And Nate's drinking the, the same. <laughs> yeah. We're we're a half hour into setup, so all of us have drank through our first beers and are into our our drinks. So this is good times. Is that five beers? Yeah, we Nate and I <laughs> Nate and I were pretty much ready to go right out of the gate, but you know. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I've been drinking since like six. <laughs> Ooh, am I the only sober one on the show? Come on. All right. <laughs> Let's go. We got to catch yes. up. Um, so, Aaron, you want to do project updates. What do you got? Oh, boy. I've been busy. Uh, for one thing, uh, I've been loving the Todoist um, task management tracker app. Uh, I've been using it to track all my different projects and all my tasks for it. But I've been making significant progress on my basement workshop. I just recently got a exhaust vent installed in one of my basement windows for my Amblazer. Nice. Um, I've got the I've got some of the two by four basics, like the resin workbench leg kits. I've got two of those coming in, so I'm going to make two two foot by eight foot workbenches in a corner of my basement. So it'll host my laser and my printers, then general workbench stuff, then the mini mill. So I'm really excited for that. Um, also, I've been adding conditional polish to the Makerspace automation serverless app. Sweet. Um, as we get people signed up for the space, I'm seeing how things break <laughs> and, <laughs> and fixing as it. Will, as you will. So I'm excited for that. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm definitely excited for that Todoist app. It's, it's really been a game changer because just, just the mental burden of... of uh, keeping track of the things I need to do mm -hmm. when I get random free time. It's been great to not need to be like, okay, what do I got to do? I've got some free time. And then I only remember, I don't know, the most popular thing at the time. Now I've got all of my tasks for all my projects and I can know what needs done next. It's been really nice. Man, that sounds great. I've been using Todoist for like six months and I have not figured out that <laughs> level of organization. So that's, that's neat. Uh, I, I've I've used about ten different to do apps over the past few years, so I have a number of lists of things to get done that are lost to the internet <laughs> in various forms. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Um, do you have any other projects you want to update us on? Okay. Uh, quick updates from me. I have refined the glasses design some, and also gotten my TPU settings down more. So my last pair of glasses that I've printed came out excellent, and I'm really excited about them. And uh, my laser works again. So after Yay. the flood, the controller died, the chiller died, and... Uh, everything works again, and I even had to modify a mirror mount because I had a, a mirror shatter on me and got that all fixed again. So I'm excited to have a laser cutter again. 
And the space has a laser cutter again. Our laser cutter kept destroying yeah. itself with its cable chain for the air assist. <laughs> and yeah, you're welcome. Um, yeah, that's pretty much what I've been working on. And what about you two? That's a really good lead in for why you two are here. Why are we here? I have no idea. Oh, yeah. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> what have we been working on? Well, you know, Joe and Aaron know that uh, I haven't shut up about Nebula since I met them. So I guess uh, I guess we might talk about Nebula for a minute. Oh, what is Nebula? Well, is that Nebula- is that cloudy cloud? Cloud, 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 cloud. <laughs> I I brought them in on the on the history of Nebula's <laughs> naming. I um, like that. <laughs> yeah, cloudy. What? <laughs> before we go too deep into cloudy cloud history lessons, um, so what is Nebula? Uh, Nebula is a uh, is a mesh or peer to peer software defined network that we've been we've been sort of working on at our day job, and Nebula allows you to connect computers really anywhere in the world they can be behind a nat they can be you know regular servers they can be laptops uh we even we have it running on windows mac and linux at this point which is really exciting and we have uh, an ios build that's uh, a very early prototype and and basically what it allows you to do is a lot of the stuff that you might do with something like a, a vpn in the past but we provide encrypted tunnels between uh, between all of your computers. And so at our day job, which, oh, I did get permission, I can mention it. So we we both work for Slack, uh, the communication tool. And at our day job, we actually use Nebula to connect all of the systems that run Slack within the cloud. And so we're in the tens of thousands of servers that, that use Nebula to communicate. And uh, it's doing a, a significant amount of the traffic, but you know one of the things that that is great about Nebula is we also created this as a tool we like to use ourselves, and so uh, I think this is true of Nate as well. But but I use this on all of my personal stuff, <clears throat> and um, and actually I, I had an, a press interview today uh, with the reporter about Nebula. And you should have seen, you know, we, we, he was kind of working through, well, what does it do here? Well, and then he got to, so I have a Synology. And my, you should have seen the smile cross my face because I, I just picked up another Synology. Like, I hadn't had one in years. I picked one up two months ago. First thing I did was install Nebula on it. And so as he's asking this question, I'm going, I, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, uh, and so, you know, he... he he definitely, I think, saw the value in the fact that you can connect, you know, a small number of computers or tens of thousands of computers. And, and uh, yeah, Joe, you've actually used it as well, right? Yeah, uh, quite a bit. It's connecting all of my 3D printers back to my laptop through Octoprint. Um, and uh, I'm running my Nextcloud server with it. I do all my management through that. So it's super handy. Right. This is the Joe. Yeah, this is this is Joe from Peoria. All right. Hi. So, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, Joe Joe has been kind of, uh, you know, in a very in a very uh, good way. My target audience for Nebula. Um, I didn't want it to be the kind of tool that only, you know, network people, extreme network nerds, really enjoy using. I wanted it to be something that was. Uh, approachable for anyone that's competent with computers uh, to stand up and and really get some use out of and um, yeah and and like I said we we created this tool to use at Slack but we use it you know ourselves pretty extensively one of the one of the fun things about Nebula is I have various like Raspberry Pis running it I have uh, laptops a couple of servers some cloud servers in different providers and I often this isn't a joke. I often forget where some of my equipment is because it's all one nice flat network where I can connect to anything uh, very seamlessly. And so I often have to trace route or look up what IP something has to start to figure out where it actually sits in the world, um, <laughs> which which is <laughs> which is a, a kind of a funny problem to have. So let's take a step back, um, given our audience, which is more maker maker's 
you know, people running maker spaces. What, what kind of problems do you see Nebula solving for people who, I, I would, I, I'm going to guess most of these people don't, aren't familiar with networking or, um, what kind of problems would you see Nebula solving for people running a maker space where they might have, you know, any sort of random networking computer resources that they want to connect or secure? Yeah. So I, I think, you know, you're going to have uh, in in most maker spaces. You're going to have a lot of computer controlled equipment. You know, I'm I'm uh, 3D printing is is the kind of the 3D printing and electronics are the extent of what I know. But but I assume most things have um, Raspberry Pis or some type of type of electric electronic controllers hooked up to them, and and the processors are getting more advanced. I know that you know it was classically a lot of Arduino 8-bit stuff, but things are kind of moving toward ARM and, and some faster stuff. And as that happens, I think a lot of things have network mm-hmm. interfaces. And, you know, one of the one of the key things about Nebula is it's not it's not really about the the security aspect, like the encrypted communication. To me, it's it's actually about the simplicity. So once you set up your your Nebula network, once you 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 know give nodes their their key and their certificate, and they can connect to everything else. It it just really simplifies your network in ways that are useful, especially to something like a makerspace. And as an example, you know the the makerspace uh, in Peoria, there are three D printers, and there there are ways to connect to those over the internet that that we have set up right now. But with something like Nebula, we could install Nebula on the on the Raspberry Pis on those computers, and then give give the members a copy of Nebula to run on their laptop. And without opening up any firewall ports or anything, they could sort of seamlessly connect right into the systems at, at something like a makerspace. And and I think that's powerful because, you know, Aaron and I were talking about this the other day, but there was the issue where uh, Octoprint, it wasn't Octoprint's fault, but they there were a number of Octoprint instances found on the internet that had default credentials and it kind of became a mm-hmm. an issue. A large because number. It was very large. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, and so there's like and thousands, I, and and so like I don't blame anyone for that. Everyone's done sort of the lazy network configuration at some point in their lives, and you know part of that is if you want to want to access something over the internet, you generally had to you know open up the firewall and then allow it in and deal with access control. With something like Nebula, what's nice is you can really just leave it behind a NAT. You don't have to open up any ports. And you can do the nodes can discover each other and, and connect really through firewalls without you changing anything. So so it's not just the simplicity; it it does add a bit of of security to yeah. it as well. Could you go over the at a high level how Nebula works as far as nodes and your certificate authority? For one thing, what is a certificate authority for those who don't know? And really, really at a high le- very high level, how does this whole system work? Well, Ryan's pointing at me. I'd say like at the highest level, the certificate authority is something that you control or whoever you want to trust to have that control. Uh, It's a simple program that you can run on your laptop or on a server somewhere and kind of cleave off or issue certs. Sorry, there's an echo and it's super weird. Oh, sorry. No, it's fine. Um, Let's see. So you you can run your own CA. Uh, you don't have to trust VeriSign or any of the the big guys. It's it's all up to you to do. So in terms of that bit, it's fully under your control and it's very very easy to do. Uh, yeah. So so like you know from from a high level, you know you 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 download Nebula. You want to stand up your own home network, and you're going to run one of the command line tools that lets you create a certificate authority. And that that credential is just what's used to sign all the others. And so um, the best way to describe this is when you think about securing communications between hosts historically, you would often, you know, ha- say you have two servers, you would put a key on each of those servers so that they know how to communicate with each other, right? Like, like this is our shared key. That's kind of the classic way to do it. Um, in a more modern way to do it is to use something called a certificate authority, which is, you know, we're and, and by the way, this is how TLS like this is how the whole Internet works now. So um, what you do is you have this root of trust, which is 
you know, this this style of cryptography where you generate a, an all powerful certificate for your network. And then when you want to add individual computers to it, you use that to sign those those certificates. So it's called the root because you can picture each thing coming off of it as a branch off of the root. And so the very first thing you do is generate that root credential. And then like in the example we gave earlier, Joe's 3D printer, you're going to generate a host certificate off of that. And the nice thing about this is the reason this is useful is in in sort of a classic sense, you would have to give every single computer on your network mm-hmm. every key, right? So so the right thing to do would not be to use one key for your entire network because then any one host is compromised and somebody can steal the key and do whatever they want. And so um, so then, of course, what you want to do is have a different key on each host. Well, that gets complicated because as you scale out a network, now every host has to know about 10,000 keys or 100,000 keys. And that that's really not, you know, that that's a problem that just does not scale well. And so with something like a certificate authority, all you're doing is is signing those host certs. And then when one node talks to another one, they basically say, oh, we have this friend in common in the root certificate who vouches for you. And so I'm going to allow a tunnel to be established. And so, so that's, that's kind of the simplicity of this is we, you know, we, uh, we just issue those individual certificates and keys to hosts and they actually don't need to know anything about each other ahead of time. Is that straightforward? Does that make sense? Straightforward enough. I think that's as straightforward as you can get it. (laughs) Yeah. I, I, I apologize. Like I try, I try and, uh, there, there's mm-hmm. a lot to Nebula, and so it can be kind of, you know, we can go down so many paths on this. Um, but yeah, like, again, at a high level, what what would people at a makerspace find useful about this? I really do think it's just the simplicity. Like, I know that we're talking certificate authorities and all this stuff, but but at its core, you know, you'll look at the at the readme and say, okay, I run these commands, I run this one, and then I copy these files to a host, and now sort of magically everything yes. can talk to everything right and and that's that's what's useful i think is you don't you, once you once you set this up you don't have to think about where anything is and as a as a great example one of my 3d printers is actually at the makerspace uh at river city labs and i was running nebula on that on the pi for that when it was at my house i took it to river city labs plugged it into the network and then it was still was just on the nebula mesh so it still just worked right and that's the kind of thing i really like is you just don't have to care where anything right anything actually sits that, that's kind of the most amazing thing to me that so nebula would be technically on the application layer as far as networking yep. on the stack so you know generally when you set up a vpn or anything you're dealing with the actual like IP stack. So you got to deal with IP addresses, you know, what's the new one when it connects to the VPN, all that stuff. But with with Nebula, uh, it sits on top of all of that. So it doesn't even matter what the IP address is, you know, on the actual hardware in the network. So like you just moved it to the makerspace. It does it. So it has its own IP address on the makerspace network, yeah. but doesn't matter to you. You're You're dealing with the Nebula level of whatever yeah, your networking stuff is. Exactly right. And and everything has a Nebula IP assigned. So that's in the certificate, we actually assert the IP address of a node. So when I when I give like an individual computer a Nebula cert, I say, this is your IP address, this is your name, and those are immutable. Like you could you could change you could try to change the interface on your computer, but then all the other Nebula nodes are not going to believe you. Like they know what IP they expect traffic to come from and all that. Um but one of the one of the aspects that you know I don't I don't know to what what level we want to go on this, but the other thing that is really compelling about Nebula is that it it implements security groups, which you can think of as as a kind of a logical firewall for people who might not be familiar with them. Where so in a classic firewall, you would say like I allow this IP address to connect to this, right? And I would have just a big list. This is like in the old school. I have a big Cisco firewall world. Um, and so with, with something like Nebula, what you do is when you create that certificate, so I mentioned there's an IP address and there's a name, but there's also a set of groups and that's up to you to define. And so I'll try and, I'll try and make, I'll try and give you a decent example here. So say I have 3d, 3d printers. I have multiple, I have three of them. 
what I could do is is create a certificate for each one of them. One of them is called Taz Six. One of them is called Ta, you know uh, Mini. One of them is called um, <laughs> I didn't want to name CR10, but I'm just going to do it. I apologize. Uh, <laughs> and one of them is called CR10. So you have these three, and they each have their own name and their own IP address. But then what I can do is, is in their Nebula certificate, also put them in the group 3D printers, and they would have that in common. And then when I want to decide what those can talk to, I can actually do that based on the group that they're a member of, not the IP ah. address or the host name or anything. So That seems very that, useful. We haven't done that with my setup yet, so... Yeah, I was I wasn't gonna call you out on that, but Joe's got kind of an <laughs> any, any any to any setup right now, which I think is is it is honestly just fine because yeah. of of the use case. Like, um, I I think you know connecting to your own network of a few things, you can you can have a pretty open permissive network without worrying about it. Uh, if you're thinking about using this on a bunch of laptops or you know even a small business, then you probably want to start start blocking what can talk to what. And security groups give you a, a really nice way to do that. Uh, you know, as another example, of this if I if you're thinking about this, I this doesn't directly apply to to sort of the the small setup or the the makerspace setup. But say you want to have uh, a bunch of laptops that can only connect to you know one server, and you don't want them to connect to each other even over Nebula. You can make them a member of a certain group, and then say they're not allowed to talk to each other. But then the Nebula. Uh, configuration on one of your servers does allow any of the laptops to connect to it. So you can really decide via policy what can talk to what. And just because things are members of the Nebula network doesn't mean they can automatically send whatever traffic they want to nice. other other node members. So would you say this could solve the same need as like reverse proxy? If, if we were hosting multiple web services locally and we wouldn't have to deal with that crap? And just I, run Nebula on top of it. Do you want your web proxy to be on the internet, or do you want only Nebula-enabled machines to connect to it? Uh, assuming we have members that aren't necessarily on the RCL network, saying they're at home, they want to monitor the Octoprint instances, or they want to log into some random web service that we have at the makerspace. Will Nebula solve that same sort of purpose as like a reverse proxy at the space without needing to expose all these ports? I mean, assuming you installed Nebula on their laptops, totally. Yeah, yeah. As long as uh, as long as whatever devices you're talking to or from have Nebula installed, you can you can definitely do that. And I th like I said, I think that's one of the really cool use cases is. You know, if you're talking to an Octoprint instance in the in the makerspace, you can do it. Your laptop is actually making a UDP tunnel directly to that. And that's that's one of the other really nice advantages here because if you do something like a reverse proxy, you're adding a hop in there, you know, there's there's a little bit more latency depending on how fast the connections are. One of the nice things about about these nebula tunnels is they're they're always direct. In fact, by design, we don't allow one node to route for another one. So in in some types of of mesh networking, you know, there's the sort of I can't reach this node directly, so I'll use this one as an intermediary. Uh, we actually purposefully kind of avoid trying to send traffic and and always just favor set standing up direct tunnels between nodes. What about using Nebula to replace something like a DDNS? I mean, yeah. So the uh, the way that most of us reason us, so, Jesus, this echo. The way most of us reason about Nebula, uh, at least in our home network, so maybe it's useful for me to describe mine. Uh, I've got this crummy box sitting out in DigitalOcean, which acts as the the lighthouse, which I don't think we've talked about the role oh, of the Oh yeah, lighthouse. we should do that when you... <laughs> yeah. Uh, but basically, the mm -hmm. lighthouse is kind of like a DNS server in some regards. Uh, basically, every Nebula node will boot up and advertise itself to one or more machines that we call lighthouses. Uh, and those serve as ways to actually learn about the real IP address of any other machine in the mesh at any given point in time. So I can take my laptop and I can go visit my family in Florida and I can get back to my Plex server and I just need to say, hey, who is Plex on the Nebula mesh for my network? And the Lighthouse will respond with my home IP. 
uh, and you know I'm on Comcast, mm-hmm. so that home IP is changing all the time. <laughs> and it doesn't really matter because that that IP address is fresh and is being kept uh, up to date. So I'm really just referring to things by name, uh, which is, I think, answering the, <clears throat> the question that you've asked there, which is you don't really need a, D, a dynamic DNS. You just need to be on the Nebula mesh. And as long as you're on the mesh, you're good. And, and we did, I buried the lead on this. Um, I forgot to mention lighthouses, which okay. are, you know, like one of the most important parts of Nebula. Um, I'm pretty <laughs> flustered after the audio <laughs> setup, so let's back up a bit. So, so one of the uh, one of the one of the really key points in all of this is if you have two computers and they're behind two different firewalls, and one's at you know your office and one's at home, well, those computers can't just inherently find each other, and so we have this concept called the light uh, of a lighthouse. Actually, I shouldn't call it a concept. The metaphor totally doesn't work. And I'll just be upfront about that. I named them I named them lighthouses. I think I named them. Yeah, it seems, sounds like a thing I would do. Um, I named them lighthouses a long time ago. And then was like, well, that's not exactly what they are, but like that's what everyone calls them now, so let's just keep doing that. Well, it, it works when we were dealing with cloudy clouds. Yeah, cloudy clouds were very different. Yeah. Uh Cloudy cloud. Yeah, same. I'm really <laughs> sad the name changed. <laughs> well, the names names can change, but you, never mind. Um, so so yeah, so we uh, so so there's this concept of the lighthouse, and that is, you know, if I have two computers in completely different places behind firewalls, how do they find out about each other? And the lighthouse is the answer to that. So in in Joe's case, and actually in my case, I think in Nate's case as well, uh, you just run this this server called a lighthouse which you can think of kind of as a DNS server. And when you start up Nebula on all your different computers, those computers just immediately, like the Lighthouse IP or hostname has to remain consistent for your network. It's the only IP that has to remain consistent. So you stand up a $5 DigitalOcean instance, you run Nebula on it, and then every host reports itself to that Lighthouse, and that's what enables discovery between the nodes. So the lighthouse works like a phone book for your Nebula IPs. Yeah, exactly. They all report to the lighthouse, and then the lighthouse says, these are the IPs I know for these names. So if somebody requests the IP for a given name, saying, I need to get to the RCL TAS 6 printer, lighthouse says, oh, I know the IP for that. Let me get that for you. Yep. And, and it's, very, it's actually very similar to what you mentioned with Dynamic DNS, where you're always updating like a pointer, right? So, so if your IP address changes, you're telling a dynamic DNS service, this is my IP now. That is almost exactly what a lighthouse is doing. All of the computers running Nebula are saying, this is my IP now. This is how things should reach me. And, and so the main it facilitates that communication. That it's not broadcasting out to Russia and China that you are using it. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Well, no, that's actually one of the really good components of this is assuming you don't have an entry point, which is like Nginx or Apache or some sort of IP tables redirect rule, you can't get on the Nebula mesh if you're on the Neb- or if you're not on the Nebula. Mesh. Right. Like you can't you can't nothing on the Internet at large can talk to you randomly because one you don't open any firewall ports so they could they could technically talk to your lighthouse right they could find that right um because that has to be reachable but nothing else has to be reachable like i said you don't have to open any ports and so um one of the other things we do is we use this uh this bit of cryptography it's we didn't invent any of this by the way but the the we 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 put a lot of really cool pieces together and this is a case of like the sum is greater than the parts but none of the individual parts are something that, that didn't exist before. Uh, oh, you said that you could talk to the lighthouses. Oh, yeah. And that's not really true. Like, you might be able to get a packet into the Nebula process that's on a lighthouse, it. but you're not going to be able to fake the, the crypto that underlies that whole thing. So you're not going to be able to break into a lighthouse right? and just start tricking like it into doing stupid things or getting it to reply to you in some way. <laughs> no, yeah. So, by the way, not a challenge directly to anyone. Um, we, we feel like we've made it sufficiently difficult. Well, no, I, I think it would be interesting. That would be a great bug bounty. Fund yeah, yeah. So, could... 
Actually, this is a it's a good thing to mention. Um, so we're open sourcing this under Slack HQ, and it's actually a part of the bug bounty, which we lobbied for and, and I'm really awesome. happy about, which means, um, you know, if you find bugs, and by the way, I want to clarify, uh, suggestions are not are not the same thing as as bugs, right? Like we're looking for security flaws um, with with provable, repeatable processes. Excuse me, but uh, but if you find those bugs, you know we we do actually pay out quite well for those, and and we're paying at the same tiers as we sort of do for Slack dot com for you know the web app. So um, so we awesome. do encourage people to take a look at at that because um, I think that that lends some credibility to a project like this. Like often you'll see somebody's created a new novel bit of software and you're not sure why to trust it. Um, and, and again, you know, all software has flaws. Ours certainly will as well. But uh, but we've done our due diligence on a lot of this. We didn't roll our own crypto. Uh, we used we used some stuff that uh, was was created by Trevor Perrin, who created Signal, mm-hmm. the the encrypted messenger. Love it. And yeah, and and uh, so we didn't we didn't reinvent any of any of that type of stuff as engineers shouldn't because we're not cryptographers. And and so, you know, one of, I think I think actually the lighthouse is kind of one of the semi novel. None nothing about the lighthouse is that special, but there's a term that I'm really proud of that I love to repeat. Oh. So <laughs> if if you'll if you'll indulge me for one minute, so um, we're indulging when you we were sixty. Th- go for it. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> well, give uh, I will use every sec. So um, so when you think about when you think about like this whole problem, so so in the case of Slack, by the way, we run multiple li- uh, lighthouses around the globe, right? We want these to be highly available. And when we were thinking about how to design this, um, I, I actually started on the lighthouse problem, and I was like, well, obviously we want to synchronize them. Mm-hmm. And so the very first thing we really tried was this, uh, there's something called Raft. And all you need to know about that is when you put data into it, all of the member nodes will eventually be consistent. And I think that's, it's called eventual consistency, right? That's, is that the data model? Nate's looking at me skeptically. So maybe I have that. Yeah, I mean, I mean, that's the name of it. Yeah. So the idea is that over time, everything in, in the network will be consistent, but just not instant. Yeah, and so so the idea being like a nebula node starts up, it reports itself to a lighthouse, and then behind the scenes they all talk amongst themselves and distribute that information. And I realized pretty quickly like, well, now <clears throat> now we have to deal with sort of the latency of that replication and, you know, nodes around the world might be slower. And so we started looking at how often we actually needed to talk to the lighthouse, and it's only it's only when you're making a new connection and you're querying it and we do that all day with UDP and DNS, right? Like every computer everywhere does that all day. And so what we ended up doing was actually not connecting the lighthouses in any way. And so I joking, joking, jokingly refer to this as our perpetual inconsistency model, uh, which is, and the way to think about this is every nebula node on a network has either has one or more lighthouses. It technically doesn't need any, but it's way more useful if you have one. You can tell each node about every other node like statically. That's no fun. Don't do that. <laughs> um, but but you have one or more lighthouses, and your Nebula node is reporting its identity to all of them independently. So as opposed to me reporting it to one or two and then them distributing it, we actually just report to all of them at the same time. So you know, if I'm Joe's laptop and Joe has three lighthouses, his laptop is um, at a, at an interval, just telling those lighthouses about itself and where it is. And it's a tiny amount of traffic, so it's very worth doing. And the nice thing about that is um, one lighthouse going down or having an issue of some type doesn't affect the network at all. In fact, you could lose uh, all but one lighthouse and continue to make new connections. And you could lose all of your lighthouses, and all you can, all you're prevented from is temp- is you can't make any fresh connections. Like all of your existing tunnels work independent of any lighthouses, because again, they're just a discovery mechanism. Like it's just how do I reach this host? Once I've got a tunnel to that host, I don't have to ask the lighthouse anything, and so those tunnels keep running indefinitely. From your uh, good beer. Oh, <laughs> the Dark Lord. I feel like you. Uh, you had one of these on here at one point, right? Yes. 
Oh, good. that's Jesus. way too much. It's like coffee. Oh, man. It is <laughs> that, the opposite of coffee. That one is so good, too. Brian's going to be dead. I, yeah. <laughs> I don't, I don't, not, I'm not really a drinker, so this is... What? Well, cheers. You both uh, are dead. <laughs> Holy cow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. We got to drink the whole thing. Well, I mean, that's Ooh. about how much you and I drank, Aaron, so... It was just dark, so it was hard to tell. Yeah, I guess that's true. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so in other news, uh, can I, can I talk about something not Nebula for a minute? Sure. We can go back to Nebula in a second, but Nate showed me, he just got a power wall, if you're, if you're familiar Ooh, with those. Yeah. And it's Let's really, talk about that. it's really neat. And I was, we were trying to decipher what the hell it was doing earlier because it was like, I'm going to take some power from the grid. No, wait, change my mind. Now it's from solar. Now I'm giving <laughs> it back to the grid. And, and meanwhile, like the sun was perfectly consistent. So we're trying to figure out what the algorithm is here that it, that makes it decide what it's doing. But it just kind of, it was pretty consistent. But it was kind of like. Randomly making weird decisions. Now, the one that makes me the the maddest is when <laughs> the solar is sending to the grid, but the power wall is powering the house. You're like, why are you discharging the battery and shipping solar out? Like this, this seems backwards. And by the way, so um, so I looked into this in and back where we are in Illinois, a power wall makes almost no financial sense, right? Like we have extremely cheap electricity. I don't, I don't know if you yeah. pay attention to what you pay, but I think it's around twelve or thirteen cents a kilowatt hour because we have the nu- nuclear, 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 no, nuclear, nuclear. Um, <laughs> but uh, or use <laughs> nuclear. <laughs> you have to be in charge of the. <laughs> Never mind. So. Um, so, but in California, yep. they actually have, they have rate shifts throughout the day that are pretty extreme. And so what is it for you at 4 PM? I think if you round up, it's 54 cents a kilowatt hour. Oh my God. Shit. <laughs> so, Good Lord. so off peak, it's like 13 cents, right? Which is, uh, no, actually I just looked it up. It's 16, almost 17 cents. So it's still pricey, but not 54 cents. Yeah. Wow. So, so anyway, so the Powerwall, like, I, I'm fascinated by this, so sorry for the side side tracking. Oh, no. But what's what's cool is, so his solar charges that during the day, because power during the day is super cheap. They're, everything's overproducing. It charges it all day, and then once the power wall is fully charged, it sends back to the grid, you know, a little bit. You get a little bit back. But then at peak time, when it goes to 54 cents, the power wall powers the house and gets you through the peak interval all the way until, and I think, what is it, midnight that it goes back down? Yeah, at, at midnight, we're back to cheap, but... But the power wall lasts longer than that. Anyway, we don't have to talk about this too long, but he just got <laughs> this, and I was like, this is really neat, and um, and a good use of of uh, the excess solar you produce, right. you know, yeah. in, a, in a place like this. Have you seen the, is it Jehu Garcia yeah. on YouTube? He does a lot of DIY power all. Oh. Well, he does a lot of um, EV projects in general, but he's working on an, uh, a DIY power wall project. And you can like order the PCBs that you just like solder all the components to and slap some the eighteen six fifty cells in. He keeps. Yeah, I saw. I've seen his stuff. It's it, it's like stackable, right? Yeah. 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 So yeah, he was trying up. to get me to do that. I got three kids here. I'm like, I'm not going to light my damn house on fire. <laughs> well, like, that dude keeps getting de- demonetized and keeps getting, um, like, shadow banned, which makes me think he's onto things. <laughs> yeah. It's like, have you seen the documentary Who Killed the Electric Car? No. It's actually pretty funny. It, it doesn't go into conspiracy theory, but it's like, why did the... EV1, which was the GM electric car, the the very first one. Why did that go away? And the answer is probably because it wasn't that good. But people people seem right. to really love it. Um, but uh, yeah, there's there's a lot of a lot of room for conspiracies in in the scale of energy production. Well, no, you can get a hundred kilowatt hour battery off eBay for like three grand. A power wall is six grand. Yeah. <laughs> For a lot less. For a tenth of the storage. <laughs> but it's got a really just, nice UI. It does. <laughs> I'm just real sad that those windmills give you cancer. <laughs> you just said that the other day. <laughs> <laughs> electrocute all the birds. 
<laughs> yeah, I forgot about it. Yep. Yeah. Well, I just can't deal with my TV flickering constantly. Yeah. <laughs> That's my biggest issue. <laughs> Wind slows down and nothing. Yeah, Everything TV. goes out. <laughs> yeah. I, I still have no idea how Avengers ends. I, <laughs> the damn wind stuff. Yeah. I need it. What I need is a power wall so I can see the end of the movie. <laughs> right? <laughs> oh. Oh. But anyway, sorry for the sidebar, but uh, yeah. Oh, we're we've had a couple now. This is this, uh -huh. no, that's this is not this is not just coffee. You've had a it couple of drinks. Like a couple mm -hmm. drinks. Um, but anyway, I, I, I hope I've explained enough about Nebula that it's it's compelling to try out. Like we're but so we're recording this the day before Slack officially flips the switch and open sources it. So there's gonna be a, a blog post uh, tomorrow and and the official release of, of the software. And we're we're really hoping that people get a chance to try it out. Um, and you know, our focus has really been making it simple because uh, good engineers are often lazy engineers mm -hmm. and just want something that works. And so, you know, we uh, open SSL is a great tool, but I was targeting not having to remember as many command line options as the open SSL command line when, when creating certificates and keys, like as kind Why, of a benchmark. Can you tell me how open SSL is a great tool? Name one way. Uh, <laughs> it is very good at generating keys when you have no other option. All right. That is... <laughs> Stamp. Yeah. Stamp of approval right there. No, it's a, it's a Swiss army knife. It's it's <laughs> exactly as useful as all of the individual tools on a physical Swiss army knife, which is not very useful. Not very useful, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They'll get you by if you need to cut your arm off cuz you're trapped in a canyon. <laughs> yeah. It, you know, this is a complete sidebar, but a Swiss army knife is just different shaped screwdrivers in my opinion. <laughs> Cause, <laughs> yes. Cause what, what happens is you break them using it incorrectly on one and then you get to the next one and they're just all flathead <laughs> screwdrivers of different widths. You're busting the file like off to change their size a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> so I have so many that are missing the end. <laughs> I don't uh, think I have one. <laughs> anyway. So the gist I'll give our our listeners as somebody who has used this that really knows nothing. Like, I know enough that I, I can put together a home network really damn well. And maybe the, this one small office that the owner of the company was like, you know about computers? Set up our network. And I was like, all right. And I, <laughs> I don't think I screwed it up. Um. Yosemite Sam was the guy that asked you to set up the network. <laughs> yes, he really was. He's was taller. Um, <laughs> he was taller. If you have Raspberry Pis that you need to get access to from outside your network, for example, my uh, Chameleon Terrarium project that I talked about a few months ago is running Nebula, so I I monitor my Chameleon's enclosure from my um, you know my laptop wherever I'm at using nebula um if you have printers you need to get access to and you don't want to expose port 80 or whatever is it port 5000 for octoprint any ports. A, any ports but any 80 ports. and 5000 are the two that are people use if you don't want to expose that stuff check out nebula um if you want to run a nas server or a plex server and you want you don't want to have to deal with ddns and getting attacked by Russia like I spent six months last year doing you know check out Nebula um, really awesome to just be able to have like five IP addresses that you have to sort of remember um, to just log into whatever server you want to log into back at your house it's pretty pretty damn great and fast and awesome I'm actually yeah. looking forward to getting everything set up uh, at the makerspace to use Nebula just for the fact that we can expose things to members without yeah. exposing the ports, doing everything securely, just easily. Like that's that's my jam. Yeah. So so Nate and I, by the way, our our day job is is security. Like we both write a good amount of of code here and there, but um, but our day job is is actually you know 
the as members of the security team and philosophically like one of the one of the most common ways that that people end up as getting into networks is just somebody opened a port for for debugging or for some temporary thing or did it a long time ago and forgot about it and those systems sort of sit there forever and eventually someone eventually their software is out of date yep. right if if something's forgotten it eventually is out of date and You're so fighting entropy yeah exactly and and so it's nice <laughs> to not not have to um directly expose anything to to the internet especially if you don't have to um and so you know again i don't think i have any any ports open on any firewall anywhere at this point because it just all kind of hmm connects together which is which is quite nice that's actually my plan for like over christmas is to close down all of my open ports do everything proper over nebula and like get everything locked back down to where it should be that's awesome yeah i gotta say the chameleon monitoring story has got to be the coolest thing I've heard yet. <laughs> yeah I felt a little bit of pressure that I don't know if we're good enough. Like, I hope you, tr- I, I appreciate that you trust us. You know, <laughs> I, I trust, uh, I've trusted worse people. <laughs> <laughs> well, hmm. I don't think. <laughs> this gets officially announced tomorrow, but where can people follow the project? Or if they want to lo- learn more, where can they go? So there, there will be a blog post tomorrow on the um, several people are coding, which is the Slack engineering blog, uh, and it'll be the project is hosted on GitHub at uh, GitHub.com forward slash Slack HQ forward slash Nebula. That'll be and and. Don't try and type that right now, but by the time this airs, that should be working. <laughs> So the several people are coding. Is that is that a uh, a reference it's, to the Slack? Several people are typing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, Love it. Um, and in fact, the the main Slack blog, the non engineering one, is I think called "Several People Are Typing," which is fitting. And then several people are are coding is the other one. Love it. Um, but yeah, go go check it out on GitHub. We're uh, we're actually writing the docs still for like the quick start we we've done some sort of last minute cleanup just to make everything even a little bit more approachable and so uh so by the time folks hear this and and have a chance to take a look it should be pretty straightforward to at least set up a small nebula network and and try it out and uh and of course like i said there's the the bug bounty availability so if anyone finds you know uh, security issues with it, uh, please submit them to the bug bounty program and, and we do pay pretty pretty well on those. Yeah, trust me, if I can figure it out, you can too. Um, <laughs> I can vouch for that. Oh man. Um, <laughs> a- away from Nebula itself, I did have a couple of questions. One, why did you guys decide to open source it? Uh, we, <laughs> so a couple of reasons. Nate will have his. I'll let him go in a sec. But but mine is is a couple of things. Like I, I've grown up around open source software. I um, I'm from the olden days, so I think I got my first version of Linux in '93 or '94. Uh, installed it, much to the chagrin of my parents, on the only computer <laughs> we owned, and they they were unhappy about it. But I learned a lot and. Uh, I'm just a I'm just a strong proponent of open source. Um, there's a couple reasons to open source a project like this. To be frank, one of them is so that we can we can share this publicly with other people who will find it useful. And I, I do think this is a generally useful tool. Another one is I never want to have to create this from scratch again. Like just like there there are so many times when you when you have a novel solution to a problem, and and this especially happens in the security realm. You know when I'll when I'll talk to other people who do security work, they'll create some amazing security tooling inside their company that never gets shared. And then they have to go to their next company. And and it's not like it's specific to any one company. It's just that they're nervous to share things in that realm sometimes. And so so it's nice to not reinvent this particular to to not solve this problem right. another time. And and I think the other one, one the other one that's important to me is it shows that we're doing interesting engineering work inside of Slack. And I think, you know, when when we're trying to recruit people in, 
a lot of people see Slack on the services as largely a, a you know, web-based app and what kind of interesting engineering is, is actually happening there. This gives people a little bit of insight into sort of, sort of some of the behind the scenes, interesting engineering efforts that happen at a company like Slack. And I don't know if, sorry, if I stole what you might say, but. No, I'd, I'd largely mirror that. I mean, a lot of my motivations around open sourcing stuff is giving back. I mean, we take so much from the open source community, it's insane. Yeah. Uh, and it's nice to, to try to give back a little bit. Yeah. I mean, like every company out there today uses so much open source software. Yeah. You know, it's... Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, truly, it's, it's ridiculous. <laughs> you know, those people are asking for beer money. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. So in that kind of same realm, if somebody had a project that they were working on that they felt was novel and they wanted to open source it, but they were getting pushback in their company, what would your advice be for uh, getting the open sourcing done? Uh, so, you know what I'm asking? I think that's a, <laughs> yeah, it, it's a really difficult question because the motivations for a company to to open source software vary it, like it depends a lot if the company has a history in that area in any way if if you're going to be the trailblazer within a company and be the first person to open source something and it's a company that's existed for 20 30 40 years you're probably going to face some difficulty convincing people i mean you're you're probably going to this is my pessimistic worst case right but you know that that's the kind of place where it might even be difficult to convince people to use open source software at least as of yes. a few years ago right and then as you, as you get you know it almost necessarily becomes the case that as you as you use more open source software i think you become at least somewhat more open to the idea of sharing some of your work because you realize you know the benefit you've derived from it um but but also to be frank, <laughs> I think I think people often open source things that are not as generally useful as they they might think. Like if you look at GitHub, there is there's a lot of software on there that is very specialized. And I think that's a good thing. Like you you can sift through and choose just the things that right. you're interested in. But but it also means that like uh you should really think about who the audience is before you even approach that because if you can if you can think about who you're open sourcing it for like who you want to use this that probably helps strengthen your case when you're trying to convince someone you should open source something like well i think we should do it because it's so generally useful to a large number of people and and one of the one of the really key points is that it not be some competitive moat or competitive advantage that your company yeah. depends on, right? Like it's entirely justifiable to say, you know, our only novel, uh, you know, our only, our, our only novel bit of trade secrecy or whatever is, is wrapped up in a bit of software and we don't want to share that. And I, and actually to me, that's a, that's a completely valid standpoint that means that maybe you wouldn't open source it, but, I think that that's also an extremely rare case. And so if your core business isn't just that little component of software, I think you should you you can probably work to convince people that there's value in open sourcing it and you know, one of the one of the points I forgot to mention but is is really important here is you open source it because you hope people will contribute. Yes. And that 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 does I will say that that gets overplayed a bit. If you look at some big projects, there's uh there's a term that one of my colleagues Richard just mentioned the other day which is open development versus open source. And the idea there is you the source code is all out there, but the core team that works on it is so committed to working on that project that very few outside contributions come in, but you can follow the development of it because it is out out in the world as open source software. And I think that's that's another viable outcome is that you know, you 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 release the code to the public. You allow anyone to use it, but maybe you don't see the sorts of contributions you would in in some other types of software. And I think either of those are fine as well. So yeah, yeah, it definitely sounds more source available, but with more 
open source uh, aspects to it. The, yeah, the open development yep. thing sounds a lot like something like RepRap firmware or Marlin has evolved into. They're such big, deep projects that we don't see a lot of necessarily community contributions as well as much as like community suggestions and desires. And they have yeah, like and, a core team. One of the one of the, so we, Nate and I were chatting earlier, and and one of the you know. It, it'll be mentioned in some form in the in the main readme or you know s- something to that effect but as far as contributions to nebula we're both we're both folks who really like keeping things as as simple as possible and so while people may have really great feature ideas i don't want to say that you know we won't run with some of those we certainly will but we'll also be we using a critical eye and thinking about how generally useful they are to like the population of folks yeah. that might use nebula versus solving very specific problems because you know i i like to keep and nate and i both like to keep things um like i said as simple as possible uh, complexity is the enemy of security in a lot of ways as well and so as you add features and complexity the the problem of keeping things secure also becomes much harder and so mm-hmm. so you know we we definitely definitely welcome contributions and we want people to do that but just know that there is a chance that we we might still say this is fantastic, but it's it's not quite you know it's not quite something we see as part of core nebula. So um, it might spin off as a separate feature or something. And and we've talked briefly about doing like a separate nebula utilities repo or something where you know I've seen projects do that as well, where you have the core project and then you have like offshoots of it that that enhance right. functionality and that type of thing. Well. Aaron, do you have any other questions? No, I think I'm good. Do you guys have things you want to add? No, oh, I don't know. Final thoughts? I feel like we talked quite a <laughs> bit. Um, thanks, thanks, anyone that uh, that made it through <laughs> us talking about this project. By the way, Nebula is three years old. So we were looking at the commits, and you know, we're open sourcing this. What are we into? November of 2019, and the first code was january of 2017 um to put that in perspective obama was still in office at least for a couple more weeks when we last committed code which seems like a a quite a long time ago (laughs) um so so nebula nebula has been around for quite a while and and you know we've we've been using it at slack for two years now uh in in various forms so it it's it's, uh it's a pretty yeah it is it it runs um it's been running actually i mean this is a fun stat and i i i'll knock on wood because i don't want to jinx this but um the version that we're running in production right now actually there have been no changes to it in about six months and that's not because we've let it fall to the wayside it's just there are no um critical sort of outstanding bugs that we need to fix and and that when i talked about like open source contributions like that's the stability we're looking for is the type of software that you can run consistently in your environment for six months and not not really worry about it because again as soon as you start making changes there's the opportunity to to get things wrong because software is difficult so so just know that like while while this is new to the world it's something that that we've been using pretty extensively and and at a pretty pretty large scale. So um, while I can't promise you it's going to work for everyone, I I think it's a pretty solid project, and I hope people check it out. Again, if you guys want to find the project, go back five minutes or so and uh, you know play that again. <laughs> Who are you guys? Oh, uh, <clears throat> I'm Nate. <laughs> what do you do? Oh, I type on computers. He's, he's he's Nate he's that types the... on computers. Excellent. <laughs> yeah. uh, can both of you touch yes. type? I have to ask. Yes. Oh, chicken peck. Yeah. No, you don't. <laughs> but we. <laughs> so I so I actually did that. I was for... worried for a second. I actually did that for a very long time. Oh, by the way, I'm Ryan. I also touch type. <laughs> um, <laughs> we've actually have you. How long have you been at Slack? Uh, four and a half years. Four and a half years. Yeah. So we're we've we've been around for quite some time. Um, I I learned to touch type because I was one of those people that used two fingers and I got really fast at it. Like the 
look at me doing 90 words a minute. I'm definitely going to ruin my <laughs> hands. Uh, and, and, and what, so somebody that I worked with back in 2003 or four was sitting next to me and they could type faster than me and it made me really mad. And so, so I, so I actually put my hands on home row for three days straight and forced myself not to look at the keyboard. And that's how I learned to type out of pure anger. And that jealousy. explains a lot. Cause I have seen you type um, and I wouldn't call it touch type. I'd call it more pound type. <laughs> <laughs> that is exa- every, every time I'm actually, especially when I'm at the makerspace and people I'm like, I'm typing through <laughs> the keys. I'm trying. My fingers are trying to reach the surface of whatever the laptop is sitting on. So that's that's yeah, it's like, <laughs> like assassin fingers. But yeah. Um, but anyway, no. Uh, but yeah, we we both have been at Slack for a long time and worked on some really cool projects. We've actually open sourced some other stuff, uh, some security tooling that we're pretty proud of. And uh, yeah, so so this is not our first rodeo, but this is probably. At least for me, and I think probably for you, one of the more interesting projects we've oh, had a absolutely. chance to do. Yeah. yeah. Thank and thanks a lot on. for having us on. Anytime you guys want to come on and, and complain about computers, you're welcome to come hang out. Oh, I didn't know we could complain. The, it's all this <laughs> podcast is. And our makerspace. Our makerspace is a lot of complaining. The hell? Yeah. That's really all this podcast is. is <laughs> Usually all we do is complain about things. It really Technology is. is horrible. <laughs> well, the worst. <laughs> except for cloudy cloud. Sorry, oh, yeah, nebula. Nebula. That's what, yeah. is what I meant. Nebula. Did you did you share the price of cloudy dot cloud oh, domain no. with Nate? I, well, I'm going to buy it before yeah. this podcast Holy ends. Shit. As soon as this yeah. goes live, okay, we're good. done. It, it was is real it, cheap. It was like thirty dollars, wasn't it? No, it was three k. <laughs> well, it was thirty dollars. I would have bought it. it. All right, so three yeah, k is but, a little bit more. I, <laughs> I can't promise that we're definitely going to do this, but I can't promise we're not because we've had a couple of drinks. Oh, sweet. Dog.cloud. Cloudy, cloudy.cloud redirects to dog.cloud. Oh, yeah. With a it's a dog a wearing dog. like VR glasses. Well, that's just confusing on every level. No, man. They oh, that, invest that, in domains. That is the invest in domains. damn finest. And with that, keep making stuff, guys. Thanks a lot. (laughs) This is the end of the podcast.